for the moms who raised us up, gave us love, and made us strong. For the praying moms who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the hurting moms who've loved and lost, but never given up. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who tirelessly and courageously learned how to do this on their own. For the stepmoms and the stand-in moms who rose to the occasion and loved us well. For the working moms, the stay-home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms, thank you. For teaching us how to walk, how to learn, and how to make a difference. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For comforting us when we felt alone and afraid. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you today. Happy Mother's Day. Real quick, if you're a mom in the room, you can stand up real quick and we will give you just a uproarious round of applause. We can give it up for them. Thank you, mothers. Um, amazing. You guys are awesome. Great. Y'all can take a seat. Uh, happy Mother's Day. We love you. Um, uh, it's a special Mother's Day. Uh, all Mother's Days are special, but my, my wife just became a mom again, actually, just a couple weeks ago. And so, uh, yeah, I'm very appreciative of moms. Uh, it's funny, um, you know, like, the newborn phase is challenging at times and so so she's been tough for us the past like week or so and I was calling my mom uh, last night FaceTime my mom when Georgia was in the bath because Georgia was saying me 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 and so she wanted to see me me on FaceTime and so we're calling my mom I'm chatting and um, I wasn't griping but I was just kind of explaining the situation like <laughs> this is this is what's going on this is taking place like you know again that yeah whatever and uh, having this conversation and uh, she was just listening being super you know like just like yeah love you you know Georgia was tough she's amazing blah 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 going on and on and on and I mean this conversation lasted you know a while we we're just talking about the week and that type of thing and, uh, and then my mom, I do this every year when I talk about my mom, I think it's gonna, um, my, my mom like started, uh, I don't even know if she's in the room, I hope not, this might be embarrassing, but um, she, uh, she, she kind of started, she, she started crying and uh, said she was having like crazy back spasms and was like in sharp, massive pain and, uh, and like couldn't even, like really endure it and so she's like I mean this is just brutal I've been laying here haven't been able to go to work for a few days and I started giggling I'm like you've been listening to me for 15 minutes talk about a baby who's a little fussy and and I had I would have had no idea what if if you wouldn't have had this massive back spasm and it was just a picture I feel like God always gives me a picture right before Mother's Day 
of the mom that I've had uh, just growing up and the care that she has, the willingness to listen, to love, to pray for, uh, to support. And so, mom, if you're listening to this online, if you're in the room, I'm going to do this every year. Uh, I love you. I'm grateful for you. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, I know that she's just one of many moms in the room, and uh, which is why I think even part of me gets a little emotional. What you guys do is just extraordinary amazing. We are so grateful for you. What a beautiful privilege. This needs to be reclaimed in our culture. Like, what a beautiful privilege it is uh, for you to be a mom and to, uh, to raise kids, to love kids, uh, to hopefully know Jesus and to love God. Uh, what a priv- what Oh, man, biblically speaking, what an honor it is from the beginning of Scripture till the end uh, that you guys have. Is it difficult? Oh, sure. Is it challenging at times? Absolutely. But what a rewarding thing uh, that you guys get to do in being moms. And so understand that even in that, there is great purpose and meaning and joy and life. And I hope that you feel appreciated today. Okay, with that said, we're going to laugh here for a moment. Um, uh, All right. Uh, I want to do a quick little little competition here. Okay, we're going to give away some clothes. Um, If you're the newest mom in the room. My wife isn't in the room, (laughs) so it's not rigged. Um, If you're the newest mom in the room, you get, you get one of these shirts. So uh, real quick, if you've, if you've, if you've just, if you've just given birth within the last two months, raise your hand. Okay, real quick. Two months, raise your hand. Okay, we have a couple hands in the room. Okay, if you've, if you've become a mom within the last month and a half, Keep, raise your hand. Is there only one hand in the room? Is there only one hand in the room? Hey, it's going to the person in the room, so let's throw that on back. Let's throw that on back. Let's pass it back. Lexi Stabile, everybody. Amazing. Okay. That's not, that's not going to be your size. You can go and exchange it for whatever you want. Okay. Um, uh, now, uh, we... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, who, who's been a long, who's been a, a mom for the longest amount of time? Okay. We aren't going to say oldest mom. We're just going to say who's been, who's been a mom for the longest amount of time. Okay. So if you have been a mom for, okay, 40 years, raise your hand. <clears throat> okay. If you've been a mom for 45 years, raise your hand. 45 years. If you've been, I see a few still. If you've been a mom for 50 years, raise your hand. Is there only one hand in the room? Oh, there's, there's a couple. If you've been a mom for 52 years, raise your hand. 53 years. 55 years. What did? 63 years. We, we have a winner. Uh, we have a winner. I'm going to give you the best item. Okay. Um, so again, if, if it's not your size or color you want, go and exchange it for whatever you want after. Okay. Um, uh, uh, the last one is I had something else. I just talked with people about it. What was the last one that I had? Most kids. That was the one. Okay. If you have... If you, have five, if you have five kids or more, raise your hand. Five or more kids, raise your hand. If you have six or more kids, raise your hand. Is Maddie not in the room? I was expecting Maddie to win all these. Uh, um, okay, so six. Do we have anyone with six in the room? How many do we have with five? Two. Two with five. Okay, amazing. I have one shirt, paper, rock, scissors. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's just talk. We'll get both of you guys a shirt. We love you. Uh, yeah, I'll just keep that there. Uh, we'll be after service, go get a long sleeve shirt, whatever you want. We love you. We honor you. Amazing. We've gone too long. I was supposed to do announcements, but I want to sing. Why don't you guys stand up, say hello to someone around you. Let's give God some praise uh, this morning.
people come together Strangers, neighbors, our blood is warm Children of generation of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be troubled hold your head up i don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth god is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from
You all can take a seat. And we are about to take of the Lord's Supper all together. Uh, So would you go to God on your own for a little bit and prepare your hearts? Lord, I want to pray uh, what we just sang uh, over this room, uh, that everything else would fade away, that everything else going on in the hundreds of lives here in this room would fade away and that we would be able to focus on you and set our hearts and our minds on you, that we would give you the honor and praise that you deserve, that we would be cut to the heart by your sacrifice and your grace for us. Lord, let us not take of these elements lightly. Amen. You know, I was, while we were singing the first song, it was, uh, it just struck me. You know, it has the line that says, uh, clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. And, And I was just thinking about that as we sang, and it's not about how clean we make our hands or how pure our hearts, uh, how pure we keep our hearts. Uh, I pray that that is, uh, for, for all of us, that we would do that, but uh, our hearts are made pure by the blood of Christ. Our, heart, our hands are made clean by His grace, and so it's not by anything we have done. We don't have to earn a standing with him to be able to sing that and to be able to praise him. He has done it for us, no matter what we have been, no matter no matter what we have done, no matter where we have been. Uh, we are under his grace if we have accepted uh, the Lord Jesus. And so with that, would we all as a body of believers uh, take of this communion together? Uh, would you Peel back the plastic and take of the the bread that represents the body broken for us. And the juice that represents the blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we thank you that even when we were enemies of you, um, you came and you died for us. You redeemed us. You bought us back. You paid the price that we all owed. You've wiped all of our slates clean. You've nailed all of our sins to the cross so that we can be righteous, that we're children of God. Lord, we praise you for that. We thank you. Would you help us live in that grace, not take it lightly, not cheapen it, um, but be with us and make us more like your son so that we can love the world the way you love the world and uh, be representatives of Christ here on earth. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So we are going to sing a new song, and so why don't you all stand up and sing this along with us when... Uh, you catch on. If you're troubled heavy heart Come to Jesus and find your peace If you're run down, empty-handed Come to Jesus and 
can find your strength. He is home for the hopeless, rest for the weary, help for the hurting. He is, He is mending the broken, bearing the burdens, all that you need. Jesus and find your way if you want freedom need forgiveness just come to Jesus and find his grace he is home for the hopeless rest for the Counselor and Prince of Peace, Author and Maker of everything, Author and Maker of everything, He is, He is, Defender, Deliverer, King, King, Helper, and Healer, Ever Song, Refuge, Redeemer, and Lord of Lords. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are all that we need, even when the worship leader doesn't know the words to the song. Uh, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy that is new every morning. Uh, Lord, would you be with us during these next 30 minutes? Would you touch our hearts and teach us and help us be more like your son, Jesus? It's in his name we pray. Amen. amen. You all can take a seat. Amen, amen. Kiddos, you can head on back to Oak Bridge Kids. Uh, have a great morning. And uh, man, I love that song that we just sang. Uh, I think it's powerful. And honestly, like that's the type of worship song that fires me up. And I'm good with all different types of like Christian music, worship songs that are based off of what the scriptures say and teach and even kind of exemplify in some of the worship and some of the songs and some of the prayers that you see throughout scripture. But kind of what fires me up are the songs that essentially say, hey, church, quit focusing on you and look up. He's really good and he's great and he's powerful and he's awesome and he's worthy, worthy, worthy. He's holy, holy, holy. He's glorious and powerful. I kind of like the songs that that we, that we see in the book of Revelation that we're going to be seeing that are essentially not, hey, this is what God does for me, and, and that's great. I'm good with those songs, but this is just who God is. He's really good, and he's really strong, and he's really amazing. I remember I went to a concert not too long ago, and it was a great concert, and some of the people I was with like really loved it, and I remember on the ride home, I wasn't like ripping on them. I'm like, it was great. I connected with God. It was awesome, but I'm like, I kind of wanted to sing about Jesus. Like, I kind of wanted to just be like, God's really good and he's really great. Like, they, they got me there and then we didn't go there, right? Like, like I think that's the purpose of, of worship. <laughs> like, 
I think, I think that's, 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 that's what it is. It's saying, hey, you're worthy. You're amazing. You're powerful. And what we were just doing, I believe you were made to do, you were made to sing those lyrics and kind of minister to the God in heaven by letting him know that we love him and believe what he says about himself. And so um, I also think that's the purpose of preaching. Um, like, I, I think that there are different encouragements that need to be given, and, and there are different things that we can admonish one another with and challenge one another with, but I believe that really the, the purpose of the Bible is to reveal God to us, and I believe that the purpose of preaching the Bible is to be like, hey, this is who God is. He's amazing, he's big, he's awesome, he's powerful, he's gracious, he's kind, and it's been a couple weeks, and so we're just going to do that uh, for the first uh, few minutes of today's talk by starting out in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Okay, so first off, it's one of my favorite passages in, in, in all of the, the Bible, and I think essentially Paul is answering for us the age-old question that I think at least to some extent at one point or another in all of our lives, whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to ask. And it's this, who is this Jesus? In studying and in thinking about this sermon, I came across something online that was a Jesus action figure, and he could glide. And, and, and I was going to buy it and just show you that there are Jesus action figures out there. Um, but I'm like, that would be silly. I'm just going to kind of share what the back of the box says. It says the name Jesus means God saves, which is true. Then it says, for Muslims, Jesus was a prophet. Buddhists say he was enlightened. Hindus call him an avatar. Christians believe he's the son of God and savior of the world. Then it concludes with this. Although he's understood in many different ways, that's okay. Because everyone seems to agree that he was a remarkable man. Even this action figure is begging the question, who is this Jesus? A good teacher? A historical figure who gives some good some good life lessons and suggestions on how to live life, specifically the golden rule. Just a victim of the Roman oppressive regime. A prophet to be admired, an avatar. What's that even mean, right? And Paul's like, I'm going to start out by saying, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In Jesus, the invisible becomes visible. This is what the Hebrew writer essentially says. Another one of my favorite passages. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Paul says it again in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, who being in very nature God, it's his essence, it's who he is, and he's the firstborn from among the dead. He's the preeminent one over all creation. That's what that means. It's not like, oh yeah, he was born, he was created. Essentially what Paul is saying is, is hey, humans beget humans, God begets God. 
He, he's preeminent over all creation. He's over it all. Kings and kingdoms and planets and galaxies and oceans and mountains and those people and those things that we worship were created by this Jesus. And this whole planet is being held together and sustained by this Jesus that we just sang about. Paul's like, he's big. He's glorious, he's great, he's majestic, he's got the whole world in his hands. But then it gets personal, it gets intimate. He's the head of creation, he's on top of creation, he's in charge of creation, and then Paul says, and he's the head of the body, the church. This is a picture of connectedness. This is a picture of intimacy. Jesus is over all creation in a universal sense, but he's intimately over his church. Get this, Pastor Tom, who I'm very grateful for. Love him dearly. And, and I probably don't express that enough. Um, but I would say he's the head of Oak Bridge Community Church. Okay. He, 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 leads, he leads it. He oversees stuff. He guides it with the help of amazing people. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I, I, of course, I would say he's, he's, he's kind of the head of Oak Bridge Community Church. I'd be fine saying that, and I'm grateful for that. He's a great leader. Okay. But he's also the head of his own body. And the second is far more connected. The second is far more intimate. Wherever his head goes, his body goes. They're connected at the cellular level. And Paul's like, yep, that's you, church, and Jesus. He has a universal rule and reign, and he has an intimate connection with a certain clientele of people. Look no further than unto the believers of Jesus. And Paul goes to great lengths, even in the passage that we just read, to be like, this pleased the heart of God. Whew! This excited the heart of God that he would be connected to the church of Jesus Christ, that he would be intimately involved with his people. Is he crazy? <laughs> Look around. Think about yourself. Think about us. I don't know. Maybe he's just God. Maybe he's far more gracious than anything that we could possibly imagine. So yes, he's majestic, but he's also meek. He's powerful, but he's also personal. And I just want to say this to you, that when you understand this, this changes everything. One final Pastor Tom illustration here uh, as we introduce this series, uh, but this is important, okay? When people who go to Oak Bridge Community Church uh, and hear Tom talk or see, see Tom lead, many would say he's a, he's a great leader. He's a compelling speaker, right? He's one who holds a position of authority, and for 19 years, he's held that position pretty well, right? But Pastor Tom has grandkids. He has grandkids. And he's a, he's a great grandpa, not like a, he's a grandpa who's great, um, good grandpa. And he loves them. And Tripp and Henry, I don't know their exact age, but they're, you know, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten, right around there. And, and they're homeschooled, and they hang out at church all the time with their friends who play different sports and, and are homeschooled as well at times, or oftentimes beyond school hours, they're just up at church hanging out because it's a fun church to go hang out at. And it's funny, as Tripp and Henry have gotten older and they bring their friends, the, 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 one of the first things they say is like, and it's a big building, if you've never been to Arnold, this, this is a big building too, but that's kind of like you go and you're like, whoa. And, and when they're talking with their friends, they'll be like, my grandpa runs this place. <laughs> My grandpa runs this place. I think he says, I think they say own, and Tom's like, don't say that. You don't need to say own. <laughs> but my grandpa runs this place. You know churches have pastors? Yeah. My grandpa is the pastor here. Hey, that same guy who leads a church with thousands of people is the same guy who spoiled me with ice cream last night. That same guy who just yelled at Hundreds of people that God loves them is the same guy who whispers in my ear every time I see him, God loves you, I love you. 
There's, there's a sense of pride in the fact that, oh yeah, he still holds this position of authority, but he's my, he's my grandpa. Today, right now, in this moment, many of you see a guy with a microphone, okay? Some of you are thinking he's nuts. Others of you are like, he holds a position of authority, he's a decent speaker, whatever. But if, if this is on a screen in one of those kids' rooms, there's a girl named Georgia right now going, Dada! Dada! Dada, just letting those workers know, hey, I know him. That's, that's my dad. And here's what I want you to understand this morning as we enter into this series. Jesus is vast. And he's beautiful and he's glorious and he's holy and he's majestic and he's bigger than anything that you and I could ever imagine. He's created and he's sustaining the world. And that same Jesus knows you, church. And he loves you. And he's personally and intimately engaged and interested in every detail of your life. So when you're thinking about Jesus and when you're taking pride in Jesus, you aren't just like, oh, he's the divine who created the galaxies, sustains the world, and is seated in the heavens, which all those things are true. But it goes further than that to, I know him. And he knows me. I love him. And he loves me. That's a wild picture that Paul paints for us in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through twenty. To, and this changes everything. We see it with the life of his friends, his disciples. I mean, he ate with them. He traveled with them. He loved them. He, he played around with them. They were, they were just good friends. And there's one time he takes them up on a mountain called the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's like, hey, I'm going to pull the curtain back for a second, boys. And they see, they see his face shine like the sun. And guess what they do in that moment? They fall down on their knees and worship him. The, the meek is also ma- majestic. The, the humble is also divine. The lion is also the lamb. The creator is also my friend. This changes everything. And I believe this changes how we should approach this series that we're diving into over the next however many weeks we stay in it together. Okay. It's called Promise Keeper promise keeper. And uh, looking at the sake, for the sake of time, we'll be looking at maybe one promise today. I had three in the notes, but we're probably going to do one. Uh, Promise keeper. And I think knowing these two aspects of God remind us of a couple things, and it it changes the way that that we approach the promises that Jesus gives to his disciples, sometimes personally, but all the promises that I mentioned, I believe are going to be backed up biblically to point us to the picture that these promises are also for us his church. And I think the first thing that we see is this. He can't break them. If he's God, if he's divine, if he's that holy, he can't break these promises. There's one thing that God cannot do. He cannot lie, and he does not lie. So if he says, I will, he will. If he promises, it will come to fruition. We see that. He's not going to break these. So as we enter in for the next few weeks, We can bank on these things. We can, boom, sign, seal, deliver, take it to the bank. Next, these promises are for us. His church to hold on to. And I believe that the way that Jesus carries out these promises and brings these promises to fulfillment are the very things, what he offers us through his promises are the very things that will satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. And this is becoming more and more clear to me in my life. This is becoming more and more clear to me in my friends' lives and in people's lives who I see, you know, and and, and I think it's this. If we don't rely on the promises of God to fill our deepest desires, we will go looking for counterfeits that leave us depleted and lead us to destruction. 
And so these aren't just like promises like, oh yeah, let's sing about them, talk about them, think about them on Sunday. No, these are promises that we have to cling to because they are not just like, oh, big universal promises. These are promises that bring meaning and purpose and satisfy the deepest longing of those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so this is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is, this, is, this is important. This is crucial, what we're looking at today and as we enter into this series over the next few weeks together. So here's the first promise that I want to think about today. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. Again, in light of what we just read about Jesus, that's a pretty radical invitation. Hey, you'll come find this out. I'm king, I'm God, I'm divine, I'm the creator of the heavens and the earth, but I want you to personally and intimately and closely follow me. And then he says, I will make you fishers of men. And then immediately they left their nets and followed him. So here's the first promise. I will make you fishers of men. I will make you something that you're not. I, I, will, I will usher you into a brand new life. I will make you fishers of men. And I'm going to explain how I don't just believe that this is for those disciples 2,000 years ago. I believe that this is for us. But especially in context, what a beautiful promise. From what we know of the Jewish rabbinical system, from what we know of the educational system, these men... Peter and Andrew were probably overlooked by the rabbis who, who kind of picked out their disciples to go on to higher Jewish education. So much so that they've taken up the family trade. They're, they're fishermen. And not that that was like some awful thing. It's just the most highly revered people in that culture would have been, hey, I follow closely to a, a rabbi, the leaders of the day. And so these men had been overlooked, and they wouldn't have been expecting to, again, they're fishing, they wouldn't have been expecting to be called out by a rabbi, especially the stature of this man named Jesus. And he says, come, follow me, and then I love this, essentially a promise, I will make you something you're not. You're fishing for fish right now. That's great. But I'll make you fish for people. I will make you fishers of men. They follow him, and he makes good on that promise. Look, I don't like to fish very much. Raise your hand if you're a fisherman in the room or a fisherwoman. Okay. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, I respect you, and I think it's a cool hobby. One day I would like to maybe get into it. No, probably, actually, probably not. Uh, I... Think it out loud. Um, I don't like it very much. I, I, there are a few reasons. Um, one, it, 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 you have to do it early in the morning, I think, most of the time, if you want to do it right, like very early, stupid early. And then the, set, the second thing, and this is real, I hate getting the fish off the hook. Hate that. Okay, last fish I caught, it was like a bat. I, I, I think I killed it, just I couldn't get it. Right? It freaks me out and they start waggling. I feel bad for them. Like, can't do it. And then the second is it just gets boring. It's just a little bit boring. But, but as, I was, as I was thinking about this promise, as I was thinking about this call to specifically Peter and Andrew, I, I began to realize, whew, this is, a, this is a much different type of fishing. This reminded me that, hey, if, 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 if I get bored with Christianity, maybe it's just because I'm boring. Right? Like, this should be the joy of a lifetime. Jesus is like, hey, you go out and you join me in seeking, catching, wooing, rescuing people with the greatest message of all time. Jesus, even here, essentially is like, this is heaven and hell. We see it all throughout his ministry. This is light and darkness. This is light and darkness. This is life or death. This is good and evil. This is high stakes. This is urgent. 
Join me. Join me. And Peter and Andrew do. Because Jesus makes a promise. I will make you fishers of men. They go out. They fish for people. They cast the net. They throw the line. They share the gospel. They preach the message. Many people run to it. And many people run from it. But make no mistake about it. Read through the Gospels in the book of Acts. This is the journey of a lifetime. Hear this. When Jesus called your name, when you dropped your nets, when you decided to follow Jesus, he declared over you something. And it's this. I will make you something that you have not been. I will make you fishers of men. This isn't like a special type of Christian thing. This isn't like a, oh yeah, this is reserved for those really, really, really good Christians. And then us, we just root those guys on, those ladies on. No. This is... This is for you. This is, this is a call for you. If, if, if you are a Christian, this is a title for you. And maybe you don't have what it takes. Maybe you're like, I feel undeserving to share such a, glo- share such a, such a glorious message and share about such a glorious God. This is scary. This is challenging. This is difficult. This is unpopular. This is socially somewhat unacceptable to talk about religion and, and fish for people. Peter and Andrew are like, oh my goodness. Those things are so irrelevant. Your inadequacy is is not the issue in the kingdom of God. The fact that there might be opposition is a given. You're fishers of Men, and let me just try and prove it to you a little bit. First Peter 2 9, Peter says this You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Here's a longer one 2 Corinthians 5 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So are you broken? Are you weak? Are you feeble? Oh sure, you are a jar of clay, but guess what you hold? A treasure. A treasure that is to be shared. Peter is reminding us. Paul is reminding us. Jesus is saying, hey, I do the saving, but goodness gracious, fish don't jump into the boat on their own. I do the saving, but guess how I'm going to do it? I am going to use my church to... (sighs) to woo and to love and to serve and to share with and to win over. This is the plan of redemption from all along. This reminds me, if I'm not fishing for people, I'm not following Jesus. It's funny, real quick, raise your hand if you've ever been to like a Christian conference or a concert that has lasted somewhat a long time. Okay, cool. I'm going to one in June with our students and another one in July, and I'm really excited about it. Pray for my wife, but I'm really excited about it to go with our students. It's going to be amazing, awesome. And by the end of the week, everyone's like, ah, Jesus is so good. Yeah. God is so great. Yeah. Jesus died and rose again. Ah, for sure. The church is being built. Woo! The glory of God. Yes! Hands are raised. Tears are being shed. And then the preacher's like, go tell your friends about it. And we're like, "Eh, I don't know. No. Or we're like, yeah! And then we get on the bus ride home. And we're like, 
I don't know. It's a little hard. That's a little intimidating. Is there another way? It's funny, we, Nine Mile Garden's right outside of our house, and uh, Georgia was sick last week, and any time she even looks out the window now, she, she, she says, Payo! Payo! It means Nine Mile. Took me a while to figure it out, but but Payo! <laughs> And she was sick last week, pretty sick, and we were kind of staying outside and just like trying to relax though, but we're, and so we're outside, we're on the sidewalk, and, and she's like, pile, pile. I'm like, no, we're not going to walk to nine mile. And then she goes, crawl, <laughs> crawl. And, and I, was, I was thinking about, I was thinking about that this week. It's like, Jesus is like, Share your faith. And we're like, is there another way? It, is there, do we have to do, do we have to do this? This is, this is difficult. This is challenging. I don't know. It's a bit scary. It's a bit dangerous. It's a bit, and I'm not saying, but you know what I'm saying. It might cause some conflict. It might make me uncomfortable. I don't know. And Jesus is like, no, I've, 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 I've I've declared that over you. That's who you are. You're my ambassadors. You're my representatives. You're fishers of men. Now you're something that you weren't. This is your identity. Your activity always flows with your identity. This is, I've declared this over you. I promised this for you. This is the life you're invited into. Uh, speaking of dangerous, uncomfortable, when Pearl Harbor happened in December of 1941, there was a scrawny, ordinary man named Desmond Dawes uh, who wanted to do something about it, as everyone did, I believe. Uh, but yet as a seven-day seven day Adventist, he had sworn to never take a human life. Uh, however, he enlisted anyway as a medic, and he resolved to step out onto the field of battle without a weapon, not even bringing a knife. And so his particular battalion was sent out to go to the Pacific Theater and they were charged with the almost impossible task of scaling a 400-foot cliff on the island of Okinawa and taking it from the Japanese forces who were already on top of said cliff. And so they scale the wall and then intense gunfire breaks out from the Japanese to and from. Intense fighting breaks out for hours and eventually American forces were driven back down off of that cliff. And after almost all of the fighting was over, there were really three types of people. There were wounded American soldiers, there were the Japanese forces, and then there was, there was Desmond Dawes. And after the fighting was over, the American soldiers were down on the bottom of this cliff where they kind of began this journey depleted. And, and they look up and they see, a, they, see a, they see a wounded American soldier being carried down by rope. All the way down. And then a little while later, again. And then a little while later, again and then a little while later again and pretty soon they began to realize there's Desmond Dawes up there dodging enemy fire risking his life giving soldiers aid attaching them to a rope however that works and then and then and then carrying them down this Cliff, and it's estimated that he saved about 75 men that day. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. And when asked about what was going through his mind in this moment as he's saving dozens of people's lives, he says this, I just kept praying. Please, God, help me save one more. Help me save one more. When I heard that, I'm like, come on, Desmond Dawes. Woo! Right? An ordinary man. An ordinary man who answered the call to go on this rescue mission that was made available for him. And then as I'm thinking about this in context, I'm like, come on, church. 
an ordinary group of men and women sent on a rescue mission and it begs the question will we answer the call will we answer the call and if we do i believe one of the deepest desires of our hearts will be met because here's the reality you desire and i desire purpose and meaning a purpose and a meaning that is greater and bigger than ourselves and I will not apologize for saying this. The greatest mission and the greatest meaning and the greatest purpose of all and what your soul was designed to find purpose in above all else is the greatest rescue mission of all time where you implore on God's behalf, be reconciled to God in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our families, in our streets, in our towns, in our city, wherever we're at, there are dead men walking, there are dead women walking, that's what we know, spiritually bankrupt, dead in their sins, and the only message that will make them alive in Christ is the message that you hold. And if we can't find purpose in that, Maybe we, maybe we don't say, we, maybe we don't believe what we say, but we believe. If we find Christianity boring, maybe we've settled for a fake and boring version of it. The, the greatest thing my parents did for me growing up, I shared this in our volunteer rally today, and I'm not going to share everything. Some of you are freaking out right now, but I'm not going to share it. The greatest thing my parents did for me growing up was model a Christianity that was exciting, that was adventurous. The greatest thing they did for me growing up was find purpose and meaning in seeing lost people be found and seeing dead people be made alive. I remember conversations from the St. Louis Dugout baseball team would be on out of town trips and they'd be like, should we go down around the fire and should we have a drink just where we don't think they don't think we're crazy. When should we invite them to church? I remember here, I remember them praying for them. I remember we have our, our next door neighbors growing up, they'd go over to the house and they'd pray that people would be reached. And I remember seeing it. And I remember there'd be excitement. And they'd be fired up when people would come to know Christ and someone would be baptized. And I remember growing up thinking, this is amazing. This is the life that we were designed for. This is it. This is where the greatest purpose in life is found. This is it. And what's breaking my heart right now in culture, what's breaking my heart right now with some of our students that have gone through the student ministry, what's breaking my heart right now with some people who used to go to this church who have been swept up in junk is, is, that, is that they... They're fighting for and they're finding purpose in and they're finding meaning in things that lead to their demise and destruction and will lead many others there as well. No word about Jesus, but goodness gracious, get on Facebook this week. We'll fight for some other stuff. And so on one hand, it's frustrating, it's sad. It's like, what are we fighting for? Have we lost our minds? But then on the second hand, it caused me to look inward and say, am I modeling for the next generation? Am I modeling for the kids in my student ministry? Am I modeling for the church of Jesus Christ, a life that is adventurous and full of meaning and purpose? Hey, we're finding lost people. We're casting nets. We're sharing the message. And we're celebrating when God does the saving through us. Am I doing that? Are you doing that? Are we doing that? And if we don't, let's take some responsibility here. Maybe just maybe the next generation is going to get bored. Let's go to church, sing songs. Live the same way as everybody else. I'm not saying that to you, honest, but it could, it could be if we aren't careful. And then before you know it, we're posting memes about nothing. Nothing that even comes close to glorifying God. Now it goes as far as to say it's straight from the pit of hell. But to some extent, I understand it. They're looking for purpose, and they're looking for meaning. And there is an evil one at work who says you can find it outside of the greatest message of all time. 
Let's come on, let's live this out. So here's the application. I told you we're getting to one promise today. Back to Colossians chapter 4. Paul's kind of wrapping up. And this is actually an evangelism passage. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that, we, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Here's the application. Paul is saying this. You wake up every day and pray, please God, please God, open a door for me to play a part in saving just one more. Wake up every day and pray this. Here's the second part. Please God, give me the strength to walk through it. Open a door, and when you do, give me the courage to walk through it. Please, please. When's the last time I prayed that prayer? When's the last time you prayed that prayer? When's the last time we had a streak of days where we said, hey, I'm going to a coffee shop? Some of you are like, you don't do that. Well, I do. I work there most days. Uh, when you go into a workplace, when you go on a walk in your neighborhood, when you're sitting on your front porch, when you go out to dinner, when have you, when have you prayed with whoever you're going with, hey God, open a, open a door for me to share the greatest message of all time so that I might play a small part in saving just one more. And when you open the door, which should be, he will. Help me walk through it. Help me walk through it. And the second promise we were gonna get to was that, hey, he says, I will, I, if you do that, upon, upon that confession of that message, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Next week, we're gonna hear a story, baptism. I read it, just a story about how God saved somebody. Talked with someone somewhat recently, like, oh yeah, I'm coming to realize I came to your church because I agreed with you on some stuff going on in culture, but I came here and I realized you don't even really ever talk about that stuff. And I've come here realizing I've, I, I'm learning that I'm a sinner and I need saving. And so he's going to be baptized. And so it's like we know and we believe and we've seen it over and over and over again that this promise made to 12 random dudes, not random, you get what I'm saying, 2,000 years ago has made it to where now over one third of the world's population are confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. Has that happened by fish, Marat, just hopping into the net out the water? No! We got a message, and we got a mandate, and there's been a promise spoken over your life. Whew, you are a fisher of men. Cast the nets, share the message, take the risks, fill the rows, and let's see God do more than we could do on our own. And somebody says, amen, 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 amen. All right, band, you can come on up. I'm gonna say a quick prayer for us, and we're gonna worship and go to God in song. Father, we love you. And when I think of my life, when I think of my thoughts, when I think of my anger, when I think of my sin, when I think of the junk that goes on, when I think of the reality that I'm just not near as far along as I thought I'd be at this point, I am amazed that you declare over me in spite of all of that, not just saved, but representative, ambassador, spokesman, spokesperson. And as I think about the people in this room, I'm less amazed because I don't know as much about them as I do about me, but I'm still amazed that you choose us together to point the world to the Savior and the king who declares over sinners, I will remember your sins no more as long as they put their faith and hope and trust in the person and the work of your son, Jesus Christ. I'm amazed at this reality. I'm in awe of this reality. 
And Lord, I pray that we're all amazed and in awe of this reality to the point where this brings about a, not a boring Christianity, not a go through the motions Christianity, not a Christianity that we get hung up on junk that is not of you, find meaning and purpose from lesser counterfeit things. (laughs) Help us understand this is the great adventure. This is the ride of a lifetime. I'm following the king of the universe, casting nets, looking for every opportunity to point people to your son, Jesus. And so God, help our worship. Help our worship even motivate us outside of these walls. Help the way that we sing be representative of our faith in you to save, to heal, to love, to redeem this broken world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand up and let's go to God and worship.
guys can take a seat just for a moment real quick. Thank you for being here. If it's your first time, uh, really grateful that you're here. Uh, we'd love to meet you right outside these doors. There's someone who has a shirt on that says, how can I help? Uh, we'd love to give you a free t-shirt. Just tell you thanks for being here. Hopefully you can meet a face and see someone smile at you and just say thanks and we hope to see you back. And so uh, we'd love to see you right outside those doors. Uh, if you call Oak Bridge your home, you believe in this mission, we'd encourage you to give, to give cheerfully, joyfully, believing that God uses it, multiplies it, uh, to carry out this rescue mission that we spoke of today. Understand that, 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 that you don't give in vain, uh, that God uses it, that God takes the little that we have and uses it to save people and change people. And so if you've given and if you're faithful in that area, we probably don't say it enough. Uh, just thank you for playing a part in what God is doing here. Uh, if you have any students between the ages of seventh and 12th grade, uh, we're having a weekend next weekend. All the details are online, but Friday night we're going bowling. Uh, Saturday we're having a scavenger hunt with leaders and having some hangs at a park and then going back to Oak Ridge Arnold and playing hide and seek because who knew high school kids love playing hide and seek so much. The edge ended last week, and I had high school kids yelling, hide and seek, hide and seek. So uh, fellowship folks, if you're in town, young people, uh, we, we could use you there to help uh, with us. And so uh, you guys are invited to that weekend to be a part of that. Uh, and then we have a group, we have an exciting event coming up on May 28th, right outside, uh, right outside on the lawn. We'll have some food trucks, different things available. Uh, and so mark your calendar, be there, uh, five o'clock ish, uh, right around there. We'll get more details to you, but it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a fun night. And, uh, I'm trying to think what else we got. There's probably a bunch, but, uh, I hope to see you back next week. Uh, we're grateful for you. Uh, we believe that this message and this mission that we've been given is the greatest thing ever. And I hope and I pray that you prioritize and that I prioritize my relationship with Jesus above all else because it's the only thing that's going to matter after we take our last breath. We aren't going to take our last breath and be like, hey, you see the money, you see the job, you see the golf game, you see the this, you see the that. It's going to be, hey, I, 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 I trusted you. I, I knew you. I loved you. And I am very, very glad to be with you forever. I believe this is real, and I hope that it becomes more real to us. And so pray a quick, simple prayer with me, and we'll get out of here this morning. Father, this week, would you by your spirit open doors for us to play a small part in saving just one more? And Father, as you do that, and as you're faithful to open those doors, would you give us the courage to walk through them and trust you with the results? And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We love you. See you back.